happy Monday. Because if it's got to be Monday, it might as well be happy. I'm Carl Azus. We're happy to have you watching CNN 10. Here on Earth, where most of us live, we spend about a third of every day lying down sleeping and two thirds standing or sitting in an upright position. That's not really how it goes in space when people are weightless and the zero gravity environment causes more fluid to shift to the head. Faces get puffy, legs lose volume and appear to be smaller. Many astronauts have complained of eye and back problems after coming back down to Earth and its gravity. And now scientists say they've discovered some new risks with long-term spaceflight. A study published recently in JAMA Network Open, a medical journal, examined 11 healthy astronauts who'd been on the International Space Station for six months. Eight of them had unusual characteristics observed in their blood. For instance, six of the astronauts had either stagnant or reverse blood flow from their heads. The lead author of the study says he doesn't know if that's actually harmful. The blood's still leaving the head through other pathways, so flowing backwards through a jugular vein may not be dangerous. But he says it does show a change in how blood moves through the body while in space. Another issue the study found was blood clots. One astronaut had one. Another showed signs of a partial blood clot. That is potentially harmful, as the clots can block the flow of blood to the lungs. The astronaut who had one was treated for the rest of the space flight and made it home safely. What does all this mean? Well, one researcher says these issues have probably been occurring since humans first ventured into space, and that they would likely resolve themselves when astronauts came back down to Earth. Knowing about them now gives doctors something else to monitor when people leave our atmosphere. All schools are shut down today in the East Asian city of Hong Kong. Some university campuses there have become rallying points for protesters who, among other things, have called for more democracy in the city. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China, meaning it has more freedoms than the mainland. But those who've been protesting for almost six months now are concerned that China's communist government is increasing its power in Hong Kong, and they see Hong Kong's government and police as being aligned with China. Over the weekend, demonstrators at Hong Kong's Polytechnic University targeted police with gasoline bombs, bricks launched from catapults, and bows and arrows. One arrow hit an officer in the leg. Authorities fired water cannons and tear gas at protesters, and police say that if the demonstrators continue to use weapons, they'll respond with minimum force, and if they have no other choice, live ammunition. The violent clashes between police and protesters in Hong Kong turning university campuses into scorched battlegrounds. For five months, demonstrators have been fighting against Beijing's increasing influence over the territory. They have smashed mainland Chinese banks, vandalized a state-run newspaper office, and trashed restaurants run by owners who support Beijing. Once the city mainlanders flock to for a taste of Western affluence and education, many are now fleeing Hong Kong, heading back to the mainland, some boarding a police boat to get out. These passengers took a train across the border into Shenzhen, China. Several are university students. The violence abruptly ending their semesters greeted here with signs like this one. It reads, we are one family. We are with you. The young man holding it asking we not show his face fearing retaliation. He tells us his company sent him offering temporary housing to mainland Chinese students leaving their Hong Kong universities. We want to help to ease their situation a little and give them some warmth. Hotels in Shenzhen are rolling out the red welcome home signs. The Communist Youth League, run by the Communist Party of China, among the first to step up to assist with the growing exodus of young people. Pro-Beijing private businesses and alumni networks from Chinese universities also helping the students find a place to stay. It's ridiculous. This mainland student tells us she left the Education University of Hong Kong after administrators canceled classes last week. She, like everyone we spoke with, fearful to reveal her identity, experiencing a mix of emotions, fear, confusion, uncertainty, even resentment towards the violent protesters. They just try to destroy the normal people's life, and it will influence our graduation. So, really unhappy. Back in Hong Kong, we found other mainlanders, like Charlie, staying put for now. I think many students are scared, are worried, but I have to say that I cannot see many mainland students targeted by those protesters or bullied by those protesters or their 
our local customers. But his mother still worries. After seeing the images of destruction, she traveled from the mainland to Hong Kong to check in on her son. Charlie says early on in the movement, he actually sympathized with the demonstrators. I changed my mind. They need to reduce the violence. Violence that's led to this. Campuses that once promoted dialogue left near empty, shattered, charred. Residents now cleaning up, wondering what will ignite next. David Culver, CNN. 10 second trivia. Which of these port cities is located on the coast of the Adriatic Sea? Venice, Italy, Palermo, Italy, Barcelona, Spain, or Istanbul, Turkey? Though all these ports are located in the Mediterranean region, the only one on the Adriatic Sea is Venice. And it was a strong storm system in the Adriatic that contributed to another high tide in Venice on Sunday. The waters rose to about 59 inches in the Lagoon City, which is considered an exceptional high water mark, but it's still well short of last Tuesday's peak of more than 73 inches. Forecasters don't expect they'll get that high again over the next few days. High tide on Saturday was actually welcome relief for Venetians struggling with the worst flooding in half a century. It filled historic St. Mark's Square, but was not enough to do more damage than already done. This cafe opened for the first time since Tuesday's high water mark, sent more than a foot of water inside, enough to break the dishwasher and the fridge. This waiter told us, we are Venetians, we roll up our sleeves and start working again. Venice is our lady, we will protect her. Meanwhile, at St. Mark's Basilica, the water at the door didn't knock before entering, but it still got their attention. We have, a, we have a more than this uh, level of water. It's not uncommon for water to enter the outer atrium. There's even a special drainage system to handle it. But Pierpaolo Campestrini says it was just the second time there's been significant flooding in the main chamber. Ten centimeters there and another meter in the crypt. The water came and went quickly, but the salt in the water stays in the 900-year-old yeah. walls much longer eating away at the marble and brick fire. near the and floor and even and on the mosaic ceiling. And that's the damage. And that's the damage. Just down the canal, you can still hear the sound of music at one of the most important conservatories in Italy. But the orchestra is being conducted by students and volunteers working to dry out some 50 meters worth of bookshelves that ended up partially submerged. But why were they ever on the ground floor? This could have been easily prevented. That is the first question. But the problem is that we, we had with the, this floor of the, of the first floor was not strong enough to keep the weight. So that's why we had to move them downstairs. The most valuable books and manuscripts are being packed up, sent away to be frozen to stop the fragile historic pages from deteriorating. They'll only be thawed out when the conservatory has the money to restore them, not anytime soon. Back at St. Mark's, they're preparing for their first mass in almost a week, praying the worst has come and gone as they wait for what's forecast to be another exceptionally high tide on Sunday. Cleveland, Ohio is one of hundreds of U.S. locations that recently saw record cold for this time of year. But whoever this is knows how to make the best of it. It was from the 20th floor of a nearby hotel that a guest recorded a mysterious Spider-Man making his mark in an open field. Why is he mysterious? Because when the person who got the video went outside to see who it was, the man, like a spider, had hopped off his web and into thin air. Maybe he was feeling reclusive or he just liked using his long legs to go wandering somewhere else. But I don't Iraq need to say it took a tarantula lot of effort to weave such an orb just display. Imagine what he could have done with eight legs. Now that would have jumped all over the world wide web. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.